Hello and welcome to my presentation of electric potential and potential energy. Um, this is the third online presentation of the semester and um, this is intended to really give you a chance to um, see some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in class twice because this is uh, kind of a tricky topic. So um, I'm going to start out by um, using the analogy of a gravitational field and an electric field. So I've done this before in class. So recall that um, if we were to drop a ball, let's say, of mass m off of a roof, um, that ball would move in the direction of the gravitational field, meaning toward the center of the Earth. Um, and I'm showing here the gravitational field and the ball moving in that direction. And recall that gravity is a conservative force, meaning if only gravity acts on this ball, then um, the path it takes doesn't matter, only the start and end points. So the change in energy of this ball is not dependent on path. And that's due to the fact that it's a conservative force acting, meaning we have no losses to the surroundings due to friction, due to drag or anything like that, or negligible losses anyway. Um, the same can be said about an electric field. So if we have a charge moving in an electric field, um, as long as the electric force is the only force acting on it, we can say that that's a conservative force. So path doesn't matter in that case. Now the only um, additional complexity here is that we have negative and positive charges moving. And as I'm showing here, positive charges will move in the direction of the field, negative charges move against the direction of the field. And so the energies are going to change accordingly. So if we go back to introductory mechanics, um, recall that we defined work, constant force, and displacement. So gravity being a constant force acting on this mass um, will yield certain equations, and let's take a look at those. So, uh, so what I'm showing here is a mass being dropped from a building. The y-axis is increasing, going upward, and I have the ground shown in green. And so if this mass falls a distance d, and it's displaced by vector d as shown, we learned in introductory mechanics that work done is f dot d. This is the classic work is equal to force times distance equation. Now here, <clears throat> Force and displacement are going in the same direction, so the dot product um, becomes force times distance. And of course, the force of gravity acting on this mass is mg, and the distance is y initial minus y final, and the angle is cosine zero, um, which gives us one. <clears throat> Excuse me, the cosine of the angle is cosine of zero. And so we can calculate how much work is done. And we've done this in introductory mechanics. And this is where the MGH equation comes from. Now recall the work potential energy relationship. Now you may have seen this as kinetic energy is e delta K is equal to negative delta U. But remember that delta K is equal to work as well. So that's called the work energy theorem. So this is an introductory mechanics equation. And so now we can define change in potential energy as u final minus u initial is mgah final minus mgh initial, in this case mgy final minus mgy initial. So this is all review. Now we're going to take our introductory mechanics ball example and we're going to transition it to a charge moving in between two capacitor plates. So we should know already that the electric field between these plates is uniform and in this case faces straight down at all points. Uniform constant electric field between the two plates. 
And so the electric force that this charge Q positive would feel would be downward. And I'm showing that here as force electric is equal to Q times electric field. <coughs> and so we can apply the same equation. Work is equal to force times distance. So plugging in for force, we get the equation QEY initial minus QEY final. And now we're going to bring in the work potential energy relationship, just as we did with the falling ball example. And so now we can define electric potential energy as being, in this case only, QE times Y. Now why do I say in this case only? Well, we're dealing with a constant electric field. This dot product equation only makes sense when dealing with constant electric fields. Otherwise, we have to do something a little different, and we're going to see that in a minute. So using this equation, we can um, determine the potential energy change of a charge that's placed in between two um, capacitor plates. Now we're going to bring in the kinetic energy relationship, so this is actually going to become useful. So remember, we can determine what the potential energy change is of a mass falling, and then apply kinetic energy, potential energy relationships. <clears throat> so using this conservation of mechanical energy relationship, we get mgh um, equaling 1 half mv squared. So we've seen this before. Here we can do the same thing. So if we did have a charged particle in between capacitor plates, we could determine what the final speed is of this particle as it moves. This is the basis of actual real-world devices, uh, such as a TV tube. So now if we have a non-constant force, meaning an electric field that changes at points in space, we might picture a charged particle moving along this path shown due to some electric field. And so in this case, what do we need to do? So we need to assume first that we know what the force is at all points on the path. We, so we're going to have force as a function of distance to begin with. And then we're going to break the path into small segments. So these DL segments as shown here, <clears throat> each one of them is so small that force can be considered constant on it. So we have F1, F2, 3, all the way to the end of the path. <clears throat> and so if we want to know how much work is done on this object as it moves along that path, that's really the question that we're trying to answer how much work is done between points A and B on this charged object as it moves along this path under the influence of the electric force. So here you might want to take a step back and say, well, what is the electric force? The electric force is um, due to some external electric field, a force is being put on this particle and the particle in turn is moving along the path from A to B. So we're determining how much work is done on that particle. <clears throat> so once we have the path broken up, we take the dot product of the force and the segment DL at each point. So F dot DL is magnitude F, magnitude DL, cosine theta. And we've seen this before. And then the next thing we do, the final thing, is that we sum all of the small amounts of work done on each DL segment to get the total work from points A to B. So if we write this out mathematically, we get the summation equation F dot DL, I equals zero to N. And if the segments are small enough, then that summation becomes the integral as shown. So work is equal to force times distance. That's exactly what this is, but it's an integration because force is not constant.
So now taking a look at electric potential energy in this case, we know work is equal to force times distance integration. We know that work is also equal to negative delta U. And so that tells us that delta U, or change in electrical potential energy, is negative integral of F dot DL on whatever path. So for an electric field, we see that delta U is negative Q, whatever the Q is that's being affected by the field, times E dot DL. So this is really important to pick up on what these terms mean. Lowercase Q is the actual charge moving in the field. That is the charge that is having work done on it by the field. E is the field that the charge is immersed in. DL is the distance that the charge is moving, a small amount of distance. Point A is the beginning point of the motion. Point B is the end point of the motion. And then we can calculate using this integral what is the change in potential energy for that charge. And so we have the equation for potential energy of a charge moving in an electric field. Here's an example problem, um, and actually an application of this. So we have two point charges, and what we want to do is determine the change in potential energy of Q2 as it moves under the influence of Q1's electric field. And so we assume that Q2 starts at distance R1 and moves a very small distance to R2, and so we call the change in distance dr, very small change. And the reason we're doing this is because we can assume that the force is constant along that small interval. Same thing we did earlier. <clears throat> and so applying the equation, we want to know what is the change in potential energy of charge 2. And we know what the electric field is for a point charge already. And so plugging that into the equation, plugging in what our actual limits are, we have delta U equal to the value shown. And plugging in for the electric field itself, now we have something that we can actually integrate. Now notice I got rid of the dot product because electric field and distance point in the same direction. So dr points in the same direction as the electric field. And so this equation becomes something we can definitely integrate easily. And when we integrate it, we get the following equation. Plugging in our limits of integration gives delta U equal to the equation shown. Now keep in mind that that is also U2 minus U1, which is the definition of delta U. And so now we have our answer. U2 minus U1 is equal to um, the equation on the right. But for this particular set of charges, or for two point charges, we can derive a very nice compact equation that defines what is the potential energy at an, at an individual arbitrary point. Now it's really important to notice that potential energy is always dependent on a zero energy reference. So no matter how you look at it, in introductory mechanics we should have learned this, which is potential energy at a point doesn't make sense unless we define what is the zero. In most cases, zero was ground in introductory mechanics, but that doesn't have to be the case. So we need to define a zero potential energy reference. Here, what we're going to do is say, at infinity, uh, potential energy is zero. So very far away from Q1, potential energy is zero. And so if we do that, you can see that on the right-hand side for R1 going to infinity, that term will drop out because R1 on the bottom is growing. And on the left-hand side, U1 will drop out because of the way that we've defined our reference point. 
So we're left with a very nice equation that says that potential energy is equal to product of charges of the four pi epsilon sub zero r. And that's just for point charges. And it is just if you define u equal to zero and r equal to infinity. So this is a very specific case that you'll end up using in your homework. <clears throat> now we've defined potential energy. So we have a nice integration equation that we can use to calculate electric potential energy. But what we want to do is we want to be able to define what influence an electric field would have on any charge we place in it. So what does this electric field do to whatever charge? So we need to define sort of a, a field of influence for a given um, electric field or, or a given charged object. So what does that charged object do to its surroundings? And in order to do that, we're going to define electric potential. <clears throat> so remember in chapter 22, and uh, chapter 23, when we defined electric field, remember that we started out with electric force and then ended up with what is the influence of a charged object. That would be its field. Here it's the same thing. We start out with electric potential energy and we say, well, what would be the field of influence for this object? Well, that would be its electric potential. And we give electric potential the variable V, capital V. And we define it as simply potential energy per unit charge. And what does this do? Well, this gets rid of the Q in that top equation, the delta U equation shown. Because if we divide the whole equation by Q, we're going to eliminate it. So electric potential is defined as electric potential energy per unit charge. So that's very important. And so, as I said, plugging into the equation and of course recognizing that if V is equal to U over Q then delta V is equal to delta U over Q plugging into the equation for delta U um, gives delta V equal to the value shown. Now notice these Q's are constant and so they cancel each other. And so now we're left with two equations that summarize everything we've done in this presentation. Potential energy difference and electric potential difference. And it's very important to note that these are two different things. Electric potential energy is energy. Electric potential is not energy. Electric potential is called voltage. Specifically, potential difference. Anytime we're going to be dealing with electric potential, we're going to have to define a zero potential reference in order for it to make sense. Most of the time, the zero reference is going to be ground, but not always. So this concludes the presentation. Please be sure to take the quiz on this presentation.